Today, I want to show you how to use the publicly available Boston Dynamics Spot SDK to connect to your Spot robot and run some programs through Python. Hi, and welcome to Mike Likes Robots, where we share knowledge to accelerate robotics. I'll be showing you how to download the SDK, how to get set up with it, and going over some of the code to discuss how it works and some of the underlying networking. Let's start by looking at the SDK. Now, what we have here is the Spot SDK GitHub repository. It's here that we can find all of the Python examples that we're going to take a look at today. And another useful site that goes along with this is the Spot SDK documentation. This is where a lot of the concepts that we're going to be looking at in the sample code are explained in a lot more depth. I'll explain some of them, but if you want more information, this is the place to go. And links to both of these sites will be in the description. So the first thing we want to do is take this URL and clone it, and we'll open it up in VS Code. And here we are, we've cloned the SDK and opened it up in VS Code. The README is a great place to start. It includes a link to the concepts that are available in this repository as well as online. It's simpler to read them online because it's rendered there with images in the right place. Now the next step we need is to find where the examples are. And under Python is the Python SDK, and within that folder, the examples. Now I'm only going to show a few, a simple one which stands the robot up called Hello Spot, another one which gives us a virtual e-stop button so that we're not reliant on the tablet, and a couple of others that will allow us to create a map and then autonomously navigate within that map. First, we need to install dependencies into our Python environment. Now you can use your system Python to do this, but what I would recommend and what the documentation recommends is to set up a virtual environment. I'm going to show you how to do that before we do anything else. We're going to start by opening a terminal. Next, I'm going to check that Python is installed. And it is, I've got version 3.12. And then I want to check if I have virtual env available. Luckily, I already do. If you don't, and it doesn't come installed automatically, you can install it with pip using something like pip3 install virtual env. With that installed, we can create a virtual environment by doing virtual env and then giving the name of a virtual environment, which by standard is venv. What this will do is create a folder, copy over our Python interpreter, and create a clean space that we can install dependencies into. That's a really good way of keeping dependencies located with the project that you're using them with to avoid bloating your system Python. We've set up that virtual environment, and now we need to activate it. I'm on Windows, so I'm going to use venv scripts activate. Now my environment is active, and I can start installing dependencies. But which dependencies do I need? That depends on the samples that I want to run. Now, my advice to you at this stage is figure out the samples that you're interested in and install the dependencies for them up front. Because when we're actually connected to the robot, we don't have access to the public internet and we can't install dependencies. And it is a pain having to transfer back and forth between Wi-Fi networks. So pick a few you're interested in now, install the dependencies for them, and then get connected to the robot afterwards. So for me, I'm going to start off with Python examples hello spot. This is a simple one, a beginner level one, that will connect to the robot, stand it up, and do some basic motions before sitting back down again. To install the dependencies for this, this and all the other examples come with a requirements.txt. We can see here. And this is great because pip knows how to understand these files. All we need to do is pip install dash r requirements.txt. That will install all of the dependencies that we need to get going, including the spot SDK. Now that's installed, I can go through and install dependencies from a few others, but I won't show you this because there's nothing extra to see here. Instead, we'll skip to looking at some of the code, specifically the code in Hello Spot, to figure out how the SDK can be used. Here we are in hellospot.py. We'll look at some of the beginning steps to connecting to the robot and being able to control it here. Now, before I go into the interesting parts of the code, there's a few extra uh, parts that make the file work but aren't very interesting for us to study. So all of these import statements we won't be going over, the main function we don't really need to look at, and there's also a couple of helper functions that will save or display an image. And these are standard Python functions, we don't really need to understand them to figure out how to connect to the robot and control it. 
What we're most interested in is this hello spot function. This is called by the main function. Every one of these examples in the spot SDK will take the same config object and they'll add any other command line arguments that they need. What the config will contain every time is a few default parameters and a robot IP address that we'll need to set for every sample we do. Also, every sample can optionally add some of its own arguments that it needs to run correctly. So here, our first line is to set up logging. We're using the verbose argument from the config object. This is a minor but a useful step so that we can see what's going on. And it shows us that if we're having trouble, we can increase the verbosity of the logging, meaning that extra log statements will be produced that describe in more detail what's going on. The next step is to create an SDK object by using the create standard SDK function. This object is how we can start a robot connection. It's really the entry point into the whole SDK. So that's our first step, create the SDK. Once we have the SDK, we can create a robot from it. So we're going to pass in the host name, meaning the IP address that we want to connect to the robot at. Now there's a default IP address to connect to the robot of 192.168.83. This will create a robot object that we're then able to interact with so that we can start trying to move it around and get status information. So to recap, we've set up logging, we've created the SDK object, and we've used it to create a robot object. The next thing we need to do is authenticate with that robot, meaning we're proving that we have permission to take control of the robot. This authenticate method comes from the SDK and it's really a helper function that takes a username and a password and authenticates with the robot using those. Every SDK example will go through the process of prompting you for a username and a password. So be ready for those when I'm showing you the examples in action. Once we've authenticated, we need to wait for the time sync. The robot has its own concept of time or rather its own clock. And for us to be able to communicate with it correctly, our clocks need to match up. What this function does is kicks off a thread that will synchronize time between our application and the robot so that all our commands work correctly. Now, if you're not entirely sure about how this works, you can check this out in the documentation. It's described in more depth than I'm discussing it here. Once the time is synchronized and that thread is kicked off, our next step is to check whether it's e-stopped, as in emergency stopped. There's a safety procedure with Spot and with a great many robots that an e-stop button is available. A big red switch where you whack it and the robot gets powered off completely, instantly. In Spot's case, we can power it off using a button on the robot and we can also use a virtual e-stop, either through the tablet or using the e-stop application. What this does is check that one, an e-stop is available because the robot will not drive unless an e-stop is available and two, that the e-stop is not activated. No one's hit that big red switch. It's allowed for the robot to drive. Once we've checked that the robot isn't e-stopped, we can go on to checking the state, and I won't go into depth here, and getting a lease. A lease is another important concept in controlling Spot. Only one person is allowed to hold the lease for Spot at any one time. When we try and control the robot, we try and get hold of the lease. If we're not able to, it's because someone else has it, or there's another problem with the robot, and the script will just stop. However, if we're able to get the lease, that means we have permission to use the robot. That's when we can start using this with Lease Keep Alive. Now, anything that we want to do that requires a lease, as in move the robot around, will need to happen within this with block. If you use a with block, it will create the lease, and then once it's finished with the lease, it will automatically release that lease. Otherwise, nothing else will be able to connect from then on. From then on, we're into robot powering on and checking out the different commands that it can send the robot. But those I'll leave to you to read for yourself. The important parts here are exactly how we start up the SDK and connect to the robot to begin controlling it. So to recap, we set up logging, we create an SDK object, we use the SDK to create the robot, then we authenticate with the robot, then we synchronize time, check it's not e-stopped, and acquire a lease. These basic steps will be required for any example or any application you write that needs to control the robot. They're also explained in depth in the comments here, so I encourage you to look through for yourself if you'd like to understand further. Now, one more thing to discuss before we continue to show the examples in action is protocol buffers, and gRPC, 
These are required for communication with the robot. And for the most part, we don't need to understand they're there because the SDK hides them beneath its help methods. But sometimes in the more complicated examples and probably for your own code, you'll need to understand what protocol buffers are and perhaps how gRPC works in order to be able to code things properly and use the SDK to its fullest. Protocol buffers, and you'll often hear this shortened to protobuf, are a mechanism for serializing structured data. What that means is we're going to specify a structure for our data and then use protobuf to generate ways to turn that into a packet of bytes or to unpack a packet of bytes into our original structure. Now for this to work, both sides need to have the protobuf definitions to be able to serialize and deserialize correctly. But that's what the SDK is providing us. It provides us the protobuf and also the generated code for being able to serialize and deserialize. All we need to do is understand how to construct those protobuf messages and how to serialize and deserialize them. The next part is gRPC, which is a request response type messaging framework. Think of ROS service calls if you're more familiar with ROS. With gRPC, we can pass protobuf messages to the robot and get a response to that message. And they'll be divided between requests and responses. And this time we're going to open up a different file because it's a bit more complex and has some protobuf messages inside. This arm command pb2 is a protobuf generated method. We can see within make robot command that we are creating an arm command request object with our parameters inside. We're also using a robot command builder to assemble that and a few other protobuf messages into a command for the robot. This is something the SDK provides. But to be able to write a method like this for ourselves, we need to understand what a protobuf message is and how to build one. So there are, in the example code, more protobuf messages being defined. Look for anything with underscore pb2 and you'll understand it's a protobuf message. Also, as it's gRPC with a request response format, we can expect that any request we make has a corresponding response object. And because they're defined with protobuf, we'll know what are contained within those fields, and we can access those and use them as we need. So that's all we need to understand about the sample code to get going in writing our own. Now let's take a look at a few of those examples in action in the lab. I'm now running the code samples in the lab. I already have dependencies installed and my virtual environment active. My first step is to check the Wi-Fi connection. I want to be connected to the spot's Wi-Fi. Next, I'll open the hello spot readme and scroll to the run instructions. We can see it's pretty simple, so I'll run this on my command line. You can see the IP address here that I mentioned earlier. Next, it prompts for user and pass. You can get these from the sticker printed on the spot. I'll paste mine in and continue. Now we can watch the sample run. With the robot back to sitting, let's see this again, but with the virtual e-stop active. We can go into e-stop, run the command, see the button come up. Now I'll run the hello spot sample and use the button to cut the power. Next, we can look at building a map using the recording service. We can go to the graph nav command line package and look at how to run the sample. We need to specify a directory to download the generated map to, so I'll just use a local directory. Once we're up, we can start to move the robot around. For this part, I'll just use the tablet as it has simple movement controls. I check that the service has started recording. Control the robot to walk through a route. and then sit it back down. I also create a default waypoint as a starting place. Find and close loops, 
and download the map. Finding and closing loops is useful for making sure that the robot knows that two waypoints are connected to give it more options from navigating from one point to another. Something that I should have done here as well is to stop the recording services. I did this later, off camera. Next, let's take a look at the map that was generated. For this, I'll use another sample, the Graph NavView map sample. We can open this up and again look at the README. This doesn't need a robot connection at all, hence no IP address. You point it at the generated map and it brings up a visualization on screen. We can zoom, pan around and see the waypoints that have been formed. Finally, let's move the robot around the map autonomously. For this, we go back to the graph nav command line sample, but with a different run command. We give it the path to the map we want it to use, after which we can tell the robot to move to specific waypoints. For this, we can bring up the visualization and look up the waypoint we want to navigate to. For this, we can list all the available waypoints. Look up the waypoint code that we want to navigate to. Then we can command the robot to navigate to the code corresponding to that waypoint. We can specify several waypoints in a row, and it will move in a route between them. We could do this without even being present in the lab, so we can start to see how full remote control will work in practice. So that's how you can interact with Spot programmatically using Python. In the future, we'll look at how to connect Spot to AWS and get value from the services there, like being able to remote control it over MQTT. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.